So, okay. Uh, thank you all uh, to being present uh, either physically uh, at IRCAM or uh, virtually uh, on Zoom. Uh, we are going to start our last session of the second edition of the Deep Voice Paris, uh, which, uh, gonna, which, is, uh, which uh, is going to uh, deal uh, about uh, um, uh, diversity and inclusion uh, with respect to uh, um, regional and uh, foreign accents in speech. And uh, for this session, uh, I am very pleased to uh, uh, host uh, Carl Robinson. Uh, who, is, who, is, uh, who is going to uh, to animate this session, and then I let you, uh, I pass you the, the speech, and you can uh, start, uh, Carl. Great, thank you very much, uh, Nicola. Appreciate it. Good to see you again as well. And uh, hello to everyone uh, at the Aircam and uh, who is connecting uh, online. Uh, very special welcome to my three guests, uh, who I'll introduce in a moment. And um, very excited to present this uh, this topic: diversity and biases with dialects and accents, both regional and foreign, in speech technologies. Um, this session goes on until uh, 5 p.m. And this is a really important topic um, because not you know, speech technologies, they touch us in many areas of our lives now. They're inescapable. Uh, they're in mobile phones. They're in smart speakers. Uh, they're in our car. They're when we go to the hospital. Um, anytime we want to access something more and more these days, we, we do it through voice search. Um, and more and more we're consuming media that is produced synthetically and I think that's just a trend that's going to continue. So it's inescapable uh, and so it's very important that everybody benefits from these technologies equally, uh, that everybody's voice is heard, that these, uh, these computers can understand what we're saying and that they can respond in a way that are understandable by, uh, by the users. So uh, I'll ask my guests to, uh, to introduce themselves in a moment, but uh, let, me, uh, let me briefly present them. Um, I'm joined by uh, Mathieu Avancy, the Professor Ordinaire at the Université de Neuchâtel. Um, Mathieu is a linguist specialised in the French regional variations, and he also runs the app uh, Le Français de nos régions. And uh, I'm also joined by Sanjit Gandhi, the machine learning research engineer at Hugging Face, uh, one of many, I'm sure. Um, and uh, they are an open source platform provider of machine learning technologies. And uh, last but not least, uh, Maxim Serebryakov, the CEO at Sanas, who are developing technologies for voice accent transformation. It's really exciting uh, to see you all. Um, would you mind uh, give, telling us a little bit about uh, yourself and your company, uh, starting with uh, Mathieu? Thank you, and hello everyone. I'm uh, working currently as a professor in the University of Neuchâtel in Switzerland. Uh, I was uh, last year in Sorbonne in the same uh, universities as Nicolas, and we. I think I'm here to talk about a little bit of my work about dealing with regional variation in French. And how now the problem is to gather a lot of data and how we can handle this all this data to compare. French spoken in Switzerland, in Belgium, in Canada, and other islands where French is uh, uh, the most spoken language, to try to understand as well uh, how we can increase, how we can improve uh, voice uh, recognitions and uh, synthesis. And I, uh, I'm specializing the, in the making of maps and how to, to plot and to map uh, variants of pronunciation in French. Fantastic. And uh, Sanchez? Hi everyone, lovely, lovely to be here. Very, very excited to be talking about diversity and biases in speech. Uh, I'm a machine learning research engineer at Hugging Face, um, and I'm special. I really specialize in speech recognition and direct speech translation. Uh, I'm an engineer in the open source speech team, uh, part of uh, the Hugging Face ecosystem, where we're looking to democratize uh, good machine learning for the AI community. Very nice. Well. I wanted to start this session by defining some terms around speech, because not everyone in the room is a speech expert, perhaps. Um, the two terms that stand out from the title are dialects and accents. Um, so I wanted to ask you, first of all, like, what is a dialect? And how do you define what is standard language from what is regional or dialectical in speech? Uh, Mathieu, maybe, maybe you'd like to start. Yeah, so there, there are two words. Of course, there, are, there is the word dialect and there is the word accent. Both are similar. By talking about dialect, you have you, you speak about the entire features of the language that they are not standard, which means you include pronunciation, but you include as well grammar or lexicon. And when you talk about accent, you just 
deal with the pronunciation and uh, the vowels, the consonant and the melody, the prosody of the of the voice. By defining dialect, you always have to 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 take into account uh, geographical uh, cues and geographical uh, features. So a dialect is a language which is spoken or some cues of a language that are only known in a specific area. And uh, defining what is standard and what is not standard depends on uh, on the country. For example, in France, we will consider that French spoken in Paris is the standard dialect and everything around is different dialect. And you can always decide by saying there is a dialect can be big or can be small. For example, we will talk about Southern speech or Southern French, which includes the entire South part of France. Or you can talk about Marseille French that only takes the South uh, Eastern part of France. Okay, so is, is that really only the definition? There is no one standard uh, dialect. Then it's simply a, a a choice by the by the people. Yeah, it really depends on the on the point of view. So if you there is always the dialect spoken on TV, you know, which is considered as the as the standard one, uh, the Parisian one. But you have some dialects that are quite equal in some uh, countries. For example, uh, between um, Portugal and uh, Brazil, the the Brazilian dialect is more common or more uh, spectacular than the one spoken hmm. in Europe. Very nice. And uh, what kind of tools exist today to be able to detect, understand, and, and synthesize dialectical speech? What's the state of the state of the market today? Um, it's really complicated. If I if I talk about French, we have some uh, some tools and some companies and some studies that they are designed to 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 find what are the the dialect features. Most of the work, uh, the studies are focusing on the on the vowel system because it's the most salient as well as the easiest to to process. But we have more and more studies with uh, dealing with prosody and how uh, melody will vary across regions. Uh, we conducted couple of studies with Nicola, but it's always difficult because we are there is a, a very big lack of data. And when we want to train some softwares or some algorithm, it's quite difficult and complicated to find enough data which are good quality and mm. represent enough speakers to, to train something. So it's still working, uh, still lacking some data kind of. Interesting. One thing I've, I've, I've often wondered, actually, this is strictly off the cuff, but whether uh, non-native speakers, like <laughs> like when I speak French, for example, would could it even be considered a dialect and whether that, the technology these days needs to actually support those. Um, I'll just leave that out there. That's not necessarily a question. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but it's, it's, a, it's a good question. Sometimes you can define some people that they have non-native accent. For example, in the Alsace, in the eastern part of France, people were used to be speaking German or Alsatian before speaking French. Mm -hmm. So these varieties are quite uh, well known and recognized. So we can say that this is non-native speech. If you come to Switzerland as well, you have many German speakers that they are settled in the French speaking part and you will listen to them, you know, that politics and everything, they talk with a very strong German accent. And there is even a name to call them Francais Fédéral, which is uh, the, the name of the speech of translation. Oh, wow. Well. Very interesting. Um, let's talk about, okay, go ahead, sorry, Sanchez. It has been the case that within speech recognition as well, that we try and get our systems working on native L1 speakers. So speakers whose native language is the one that we're trying to operate on uh, with L2 or non-native speakers seen as more of a challenge, almost an out of domain or out of distribution data type. And it kind of comes down to that level of granularity that you put on what is the dialect as well. Like, do we consider a non-native speaker to be part of the same dialect? Do we consider them to be one that's different? And then that also ties into the question of data sets with granularity with data sets. If we have a data set that claims that it covers a, a lot of different dialects, well, we have to open open the box and really see to what extent that claim is true and on what level mm. that data set is operating on, because then that dictates how our model is going to be operating as well. Very interesting. Um, we can talk a bit about accents as well. Um, Maxine, this is a question I, I should, should put to you first, because uh, that is your business. Um, what is a speech accent? How do we define it? Does everybody have an accent? Is it something you learn or that you're born with? Um, tell us what what is what are accents? Yeah, great question. So um, I think Matteo really described accents well in that they're closely associated with the individual phonemes that are present um, uh, within speech. Um, 
accents are oftentimes represented when a person's communicating in languages that um, aren't necessarily, well, they're, they're a lot more obvious when a person's communicating in a language that isn't necessarily their native tongue. Um, so if you're normally speaking in French and you're communicating in English, you could speak in a French accent. Um, that's when it becomes very um, obvious. So accents have a few components to them. Obviously it's the phonetics. Um, there are also uh, pitch based components to accents um, as well as duration based components in that uh, different languages communicate in uh, different phonemes and uh, different durations. So I, I, I would qualify those three um, large categories as being the features of accent and accent itself is the underlying phonemes. Mm, phonetics, pitch, duration. Is it possible for a, a person to have more than one accent depending on the language they're speaking or by, by will alone? And accents change as well. You, you know, um, one of the things that we really care about, our first horizon of deployment at Sonus is actually with call centers. And one thing that you see very often in call centers is uh, people end up going into call centers and working there for a really long time. And uh, their accents change in a way that um, uh, markets itself better to the consumers that they sell to. So if you are, you know, a, a French call center employee um, communicating with um, American-based customer uh, customers, you end up modifying your accent in a way that sounds closer to your customer base. So it becomes a weird merge between French and American accents. And yeah, it's it's definitely a spectrum. There, uh, certain people pronounce certain phonemes in certain ways. So um, hmm. yeah. And I and, you know, for example, like Carl, if, if you lived, uh, you know, in the UK for a long time and um, then you moved to Ireland and uh, then you moved to the south part of UK, then you moved to the north, your accent will be very, very different than um, just a person that's lived in London their whole life. So. Well, you know, I, I'm sure that's true for a lot of people. I, I've, I've lived all over all over the world, and I don't think my voice has changed at all. I seem to be impervious to the <laughs> the regional influence, but um, that's just me. Um, what what about the tools? I mean, obviously, you know, um, Sanas exists to to synthesize accents in speech. I believe that's the the, the primary focus. But well, what about the, the the range of tools around accents to detect and to understand accents as well? What's the level of sophistication of these tools today? Yeah, there, there, there are a bunch of tools that, um, I mean, whenever dealing with classification problems, um, oftentimes not overall, they're, they're a lot similar than simpler than generative based questions. So um, the topics associated with classifying accents, it's largely a data question. There, there are a bunch of algorithms that are present out there um, mm. in my eyes. Uh, but when it comes to um, actually generating an accent, um, especially in real time with a low latency. Um, that becomes very, very complicated. And we ourselves at Sonus stumbled upon kind of a, a, a white space that's been really overlooked in, in the research world and that uh, there's voice conversion, uh, modern day voice conversion, um, but um, voice, you could convert a voice and make me sound like, I don't know, a female version of my voice or mm -hmm. make me sound like Batman or something like that. But then you're gonna have an, I'm originally from Eastern Europe, then you're gonna have an Eastern European accent to Batman. Uh, which is a hilarious concept, uh, but I think that really defines the distinction between uh, between these uh, these these two spaces. Um, so when it comes to accents and generative based tasks, perhaps except for TTS, um, and accent conversion has been really overlooked. Um, uh, but classification, I think there are plenty of resources. Interesting, Sanchez. What about on the the hugging face side? What 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 exists? Uh, around accents to detect or synthesize or transform? Yeah, so we're actually similar to what Maxim said, like quite a lot of the work which has been done is in the field of TTS. And that's something that we're starting to breach into now. So we're almost there with having our first TTS model available on the hub. And yes. it is it is still kind of like the white space for us as well. I think uh, Maxim and Sonus have done a very good job at getting in there early. And it's, it's not something which Hugging Faces uh, currently very much at the forefront of as well and it seems to be one of the things that we're we're looking to improve on as well and mm. uh, get more support for because it's a it's a difficult problem one that has been overlooked and uh in that regard we've somewhat followed that trend so it's a case of um yeah trying to integrate the the top uh models when it comes to accent and dialect detection and also synthesis uh because it's a 
it's a field that's moving very quickly as well. And so it's important that we all keep up with what currently is state of the art. Yeah, absolutely. Would you say it's true that um, in the early days of Hugging Face, it was more focused on NLP and treating text and things have moved more and more towards the, the audio data as, as time's gone on? Yeah, so it definitely started off as an NLP focused company. And over time, it's broadened out into one that's more machine learning based. So whilst we're still very strong within NLP and NLP is probably the domain of machine learning in which we have the most facilities, the most models, the most data sets. Um, we're now a company that serves for, we serve the community for both NLP, um, audio, and also computer vision. So it's really the spectrum of all, uh, of all new facets of machine learning, and we're looking into reinforcement learning as well. Uh, and then within the audio, within the audio side, it's still fairly new, and um, there's a real focus on the the models and the tasks that are used most by the community, and then trying to fix all those issues along the way. So mm -hmm. it's kind of a case of putting these models into the hands of hands of the community, letting them play with them. We're finding out what the issues are and working with the community to try and fix them along the way. And so bias is a, a really big one as well. And that we see time and time again that the models are biased and we then have to look into ways in which we can mitigate them and, and fix them. Okay, excellent. Well, that leads me on to the next question then. So what does it actually mean to have uh, diversity and biases with dialects and accents in speech speech technologies, I mean, what, what is it that we're specifically talking about? Is it bias in the models and the data sets in the applications that are built, uh, all three, uh, maybe even the bias in the, the people that are constructing these models and data sets? Um, what, where, where do these, um, these biases uh, exist and where is there a, a lack of diversity? Well, I think it's that's a very good question. I think it's one that we're all as practitioners and researchers trying to understand and unpick from every angle. I don't think as we're defining what a dialect or an accent is, there isn't a hard and fast way of defining it. Mm -hmm. I think uh, many researchers look into each of those aspects in isolation. It's currently very hard to look at the whole picture uh, yeah. as, a, as a whole. And so um, I think quite a lot of work is being done into well, the idea being that as a practitioner, you have choice over what data set you train your model on. The data set then encompasses the data, the information on which the model is then trained. The model then learns to replicate the mapping that it sees in the data. So you kind of have this hierarchy of as you move from practitioner to data set to model to predictions, you see the information flow propagate through. And so if you are to tackle a bias, the further up you can get in that chain, the more impact you can have as you propagate and move downstream. Interesting. So that suggests that it's the really we need to tackle the the diversity of the people constructing the data sets and the models before we actually look at the the results of their work. Yeah, so I think it's almost cyclic in the sense that we see the results of the work and we then act based on on that almost like into as a machine learning system to then improve on our predictions. So we then kind of, we close, we close the loop and we come back as a practitioner and we look at our models and we assess what predictions they made and try and gauge where we could potentially make improvements, try and shed light on what sorts of biases are present within the model. And then we go back to the start and we say, okay, now as a practitioner, what can I do to fix that? And so is that a case of like, we need to curate better data sets? Is it a case that we need to train our model in a different way? Is it a case that we need to regularize our predictions in a certain way? Do we need to force them to behave in a certain way? Or do we need to change our outlook on what it is we're trying to achieve? Mm. Um, so I think it's it's almost like a closed feedback loop um, within, within that sense, within the ML sphere. What about the other, other panelists? Uh, do, you, do you have anything to add to that? For me personally, Carl, I think accents and dialects are what lead to biases in any of these models that are present. So um, we have these speech to text models where someone communicates and um, you, you know say with um, a Indian accent and they say something into Amazon Alexa and um, you know for example like Amazon Alexa play Old McDonald had a farm. You, you, you know if you have a kid you know you're, you're playing mm. instantaneously <laughs> it recognizes some other song. Um, mm. And that's largely associated with just the data sets that um, not calling out Amazon, but in, in general, a lot, of, a lot of these big tech companies have gathered to train their, uh, their speech to text or speech recognition engines. So um, I think accents and, uh, and um, uh, dialects in general um, lead to that. But the problem there is 
the sheer number of different accents and dialects that are present on earth. Mm. You know, I mentioned India, India alone, you know, Hindi, I think there are probably around 300 million people that speak Hindi. Um, each, you know, 10 kilometer radius that you're going, uh, an accent and dialect changes significantly. Um, and then in India also, you go down south and you have the Kannada accent, which is more of like a stereotypical conventional Indian accent. Then you go to the northeast and you hear a Manipuri accent, which honestly sounds more um, Australian than it sounds Indian. Um, and um, there you realize uh, how, how different accents can be. And, and it makes a lot more sense why these speech to text engines um, don't perform well on, on, on all speakers. Um, mm. But it's, it's a matter of time. You know, the more time it takes, the more uh, data you're able to gather, the better models you're able to train. Um, but, you know, the model evaluation pipeline, the ML sort of evaluation pipeline, the uh, life cycle that Sunship mentioned is, is very relevant for countering that better understanding. So, so how do you how do you measure the the lack of diversity or the biases if you if you're not sure even what to to look for are you relying on the community reporting these these results um because i imagine having, there are there are many types of bias right yeah carl absolutely community and having a killer test set and so there is a definition of success if it runs on a on a test set then you can you can say this is a, an unbiased model um but um, I mean, there are always going to be exceptions that are outside of your um, test set. <laughs> so mm. That's where the community comes in, gives you feedback, and lets you know a little bit more about uh, what things that you have to address and, and look into further. Yeah, because um, maybe I'm not sure. Time. Maybe the test set is biased. <laughs> like, oh, true. Very true. Mm. What, what kind of biases are we talking about then? I mean, off the top of my head, obviously, there's language bias you know i live in a bilingual household and you know i can speak to google assistant much more easily than my uh, my french wife um there's of course race and gender which is like you know the two hot topics uh what what others exist what i think those are the big ones there <laughs> <laughs> those are the ones we hear about all the time in the news there's there's a there's an issue with age as well like in terms of mm -hmm. um of the voc like even even the simplest thing of the vocabulary that we use is different as between generations and you've got to make sure within your within your speech systems as well that they're designed to be able to handle the full spectrum of age it's sort of every dimension of personality that you could have with a person or a, di a difference in in who we are there's there's another dimension of how you could have a bias true it's a broad spectrum and mm. we're kind of targeting the ones where we see the biggest impact the biggest sensitivity but you could really, it's, it's just an endless rabbit hole in terms of to what extent you could find these biases and systems. But it is a case that we're trying to rule out the top ones as we as we go on. And sure. the, the beauty of uh, what you guys were talking about with the community as well is that by opening things up to the community, you have people who find that a system works poorly and they're, super, they're then super motivated to go and try and help and fix it. So if you've got a community with whom a speech system performs poorly, they might then be motivated to go and donate their data and give their voice to a, a, a new data set. And that then hopefully pulls back into that feedback cycle that we were talking about with some external influence, which then really helps uh, feeding everything back and improving the systems for the next generation. Excellent. Mathieu, I'm sure uh, that there's one uh, one type of bias that, that you're most concerned with, which is the, the regional language bias. Um, do, uh, do voice assistants and uh, and speech technologies in general work equally well across France? Yeah, it depends actually on the on the level of accent of the of the people using. For example, you have some very old people that they still kept some uh, archaic features. We were talking about this just before, and yeah, sometimes the the speech the, the 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 systems are not used to to recognize this kind of stuff. So, for example, I'm sure that if some grandparents they just use my smartphone to talk inside, they will not be recognized at all because you can wonder is there a need to train some uh, some specific tools for these people because mm. they they their dialect is going to die. I mean, these dialect features are going to die because they are too strong. So. The, the this is one of the of the of the premise quite what we could say the age of the speakers uh, which does not appear in the in what we were talking before 
Yeah, and the perceived utility of that user as well, which is actually a, a form of discrimination, I'd imagine, because you know they're not considered worth worthy of uh, training a model, and therefore they're just completely unserved by the the latest technology. Mm -hmm. And as well, yeah, some uncovered uh, dialects that they are never used to train something. I remember one was the first system of Siri were coming and they were not working in Switzerland because the French used was the one in France and uh, the accent of Switzerland or Belgium were not being recognized at the really beginning. Yeah. Yeah, I saw, um, I saw an article talking about GPT-3. And uh, it's fantastic at talking about or answering questions about itself or AI, but terrible at talking about you know current affairs or, or something more more relevant that you, you might want to ask it. So it's not just you know these uh, these niches or minorities, if you want to call them that, that that suffer. It's it's everybody depending on the use case that you have in mind. Um, and so domain, I think, is a, is another one. Um, I wanted to ask. Ask you then. So, where do these biases come from? Because Sanchi, you mentioned it's you know it's about availability of data. Is that the big one? Are there others? Are there other reasons that cause these these biases and lack of diversity? Yeah, the, the, the data is very important, but as well you have the, the I think one of the biggest problems is to know what we put in this system. So what are the features that we want to use and which one are relevant as well? We have to be very careful by choosing these features, not to uh, how to say, uh, not to point something or you know, to imitate someone and be not nice by uh, imitating some specific intonation or increase or we would say in French singer, which means create like a monkey or to make a, a, a wrong a feature and uh, people will think that we are making fun of them by exaggerating some features oh, yes. and that would lead to what we call uh, since a few years glotophobia which is uh, the 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 making fun of somebody or not taking somebody uh, um, uh, um, correctly because his accent is not okay it's not standard so the the the, the prima really the selection of the of the features and uh, the problem of the data is one thing i mean that can be solved but the, the the selection of the features that we put in the system that we use to say this is uh, this will mark the dialect of this region or these features will uh, can be used to detect this accent is quite difficult as well for languages or systems like French or uh, languages spoken in France, it can be quite difficult to find some features that are only used in one region. And uh, sometimes you will have some features that are known in the south, but as well in some very peripheral uh, uh, region of France. So this is another issue. Also, could I could I ask you whether whether you whether you think there's an advantage to using a completely end to end approach in which there's no human feature engineering? Like if you if you were to let a system learn from the data itself without any any human influence, without any inputs of human knowledge. Do you think that's a better way of potentially mitigating bias? Yeah, I think it's the best way because you can take this way, you can take into account everything, not only focus on uh, vowel or on consonant, but you can take as well prosody and rhythm and all these things. So I think that's quite the best. But what I've been doing, I mean, uh, when we were trying to improve uh, before the, some uh, uh, speaking, some machine spoke, speaking uh, uh, system, we were just to, to arrange, we were just selecting some very specific features like uh, adding some vowels or changing the the, the 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 quality of a vowel, and we were seeing some very big improvements in the judgments of the native speakers that they were evaluating the speech system. And by just changing some very little features that we were controlling, the 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 the, the grades that they were giving were much much uh, better when we were evaluating. So is there potentially a way of then optimizing a system to another speaker if you if you find that there are these features that you can add like a a, a vowel is there a method in which you can quickly adapt your yeah, system? yeah, and it's, it's quite easy because you can just, you know, grab a few paper and you will say, okay, this is the speak of uh, Toulouse and this is the, the, the French of uh, of Lille and you can just select some very uh, fast and quick features that you could not maybe uh, uh, find when you were training from uh, from scratch. And that really works. I mean, this really helps to increase and to 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 in the speech recognition as well. Which, which I think is the beauty of 
using human crafted feature engineering approaches because then you can it's interpretable in the sense that when you change things you can see what aspects what features you're changing to shift from different dialects and different speakers which is yeah yeah and it's and i think it's the the, the two ways you know by all the entire automatic and as well the expert approach that can really improve in the end always being careful of uh, not to exaggerate some features Yes, because it's exactly that. The end-to-end -end approach <laughs> where, you, where you take away the human aspect. Yeah, that, that, I, I don't know if you saw that they created some uh, some ways, you know, this app to, to drive and to avoid uh, um, traffic and stuff. And they put some uh, regional accents. So it was a big hit, but they used some comedian. And you can see that they, yeah, yeah they exaggerate some features and people were very, were not happy about it. It's a, it's a touchy subject, I'm sure. Um, I thought we could take this, mo take this moment to actually ask you a bit more about your app, actually, Le Français de nos Régions, uh, I say in an English accent. Um, and uh, um, tell us, like, you know, who's, who's the app for and uh, what problem it solved? Like, what, why, did, why did you build it? Yeah, the, the idea of the app was to 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 use the, the 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 internet and the potential of social network to 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 ask people to record themselves in the in the phone. So we just designed a little uh, a, a little game. So we you answer a few questions and you have some sounds. You have to say, okay, do you pronounce this way? Do you say PK or do you say PK? Do you say mm -hmm. sort or sort or some stuff like this? In the end, the algorithm will tell you, oh, you you come from there or you come from this island or from this part of Canada and people will be happy they will judge and say okay I'm, i agree with the the accent detection or the dialect detection and then this is the most interesting point they will arrive on a new uh, uh, features of the app and they will have to answer a few questions to say okay i'm a, a male speaker i'm 40 i'm coming from there i grew up there and then they have some questions that uh, they will see a word and they have to record the word so we use some words that i use for accent and uh, dialect features uh, recognition so for example you will see a bill of 100 euros and you have to say this is a bill of 100 euros 100 euros or 100 euros or 100 euros etc so we the, the the data are coming in the atlas and uh, we all we gather them all uh, you can then listen on the app um, by mm -hmm. clicking on the on the map and you can listen to all the sounds so so far we have i think 190,000 speech files that they arrived the app was released in november it was quite it was didn't make a big hit in the in the media but uh, it's used every day because people are coming on the blog they found us on the social media and they they really record themselves so we gather a lot of uh, of speech samples and we are really looking forward to have uh, all these elements for example i don't know for france we have uh, eight or nine thousand um, uh, recordings of the same word so oh, so so, nice. so you can really find where the the, the boundaries between dialects are, are located. Mm. Yeah, I can imagine it's definitely something that the uh, the press would like to write about, perhaps more in the in terms of the findings, if you find any kind of shocking findings that this is what they want to latch on to, of course. Um, is it, what have you learned about the, the, the regional languages in, in, in French or the regional variations of the French language uh, from the from the data you collected? Has, has anything surprised you? Yeah, so we were we have some words, but we have as well some sentences and some uh, other funny features which are more spontaneous speech. And we we, we found some really interesting uh, um, um, boundaries between the use, for example, of O and O. And I know it's quite difficult for people that they don't speak French to understand the difference, but it's very strong in French if you say rose or rose. And we could see that the line between the south and the and the north is quite uh, always the same between all. All these words with O and O, so they are not uh, no lexical, uh, quite very little lexical variation as well. We can see that the boundaries, political boundaries between Switzerland and uh, and uh, Belgium and France, for example, are sometimes some linguistic boundaries. You can really jump from one side to another of the country, and you will see that the people will talk differently on just one word. And this is very, very uh, interesting as well. We have 
couple of data that they are paired so we can compare very well the duration the length where it's uh, relevant so it's kind of, it's quite a good uh, um, good surprise for everything the, the next step of the app would be to use all these words to have uh, systems that detect the accent or detect the dialect on the voice so for example we will ask people to read a sentence and we on the base of a 10, 10 or 15 sentences. We hope that we can locate them in space because now we use some representation question. You have to say, do you say rose or rose? So people will think what they do. And we really want now to use the, the phone as a speech recognizer so we can locate the people based on the voice. Very nice. And is that data or the, an API or some kind of connected to it available to other researchers? Does it enable other research to, to happen? Yeah, yeah. So now you can you can just listen to the data on the phone. They are, they, it's here. You can you can find it very easily on the on the App Store on the Google Store. The uh, the app should leave uh, should lead to a, a, a spoken atlas that is still not online, but will be online very soon. And all the data uh, that are recorded and the, all the data that the people say, okay, you can use them. You can put them on the internet because they have the choice to release them or not to release them. Uh, will be used for non uh, commercial uh, purpose so anyone who is interested is free to to download them and to use them by just mentioning the app nice so so maybe we'll see a hugging face data set uh, arrive sometime soon but perhaps not a, a sanas integration yeah so the, i i really hope that uh, yeah i really hope that we will uh, gather more money and mm. <laughs> and develop a better algorithm fantastic okay um i wanted to ask uh, about the impact and the consequences of a lack of diversity or, uh, uh, or, or the presence of bias in, in speech technologies. Um, this open question to, to everyone, uh, who is impacted by a lack of diversity or biases in speech technologies? And uh, what are the consequences? Maybe you have some examples. Um, you know, I would say it's probably folks that the primary folks that are impacted are folks who have edge cases in their speech. Um, uh, I think actually one of the other points of diversity that we also haven't completely mentioned, uh, going back to your question a while ago, um, we mentioned age, we mentioned uh, gender, we mentioned um, uh, you know um, different locations, but another big one is uh, folks with uh, certain innate um, conditions, you know, stutters and um, other uh, conversational problems. And, um, you'd be surprised how many people fall into um, the category of being an edge case speaker, um, according to most conventional machine learning models. I don't have any statistics on it, but I'm sure it's actually very, very significant just because of the sheer diversity of different um, speech. Yeah, I guess it depends on the context as well. Um, an English accent in, in one context is standard and in another it's uh, it's completely an edge case. Yeah. It's also like topics of conversation. Like what, what is someone talking about? You know, a certain utterance could be very well recognized by a certain system while um, uh, another one um, is, is very not well recognized. I mean, that also varies by um, the granularity of the analysis. Is it a sentence level? Is it a, a word level? Is it a phoneme level? So character level. Um, mm -hmm. That's another big thing. Have you had any requests coming to, to Sanas or any of your companies around uh, the need to, to increase diversity? Have you had requests saying, oh, this, you know, I'd love to hear this accent supported or I'd love to see you uh, produce this oh. model in response? Oh, yeah. We, we get a huge number of inbounds every single day asking for new accents. Um, we've had inbounds from call center employees asking for this being implemented um, in um, Eastern Europe where they're selling to uh, the United Kingdom and, and, and Europe, and uh, they wanna be able to um, uh, communicate the way they sound. Even uh, folks that have recently went through gender reassignment surgery, um, yeah. and they want to sound, sound, they want control over their voice and, and to sound a particular way. Uh, so Sonus is a technology that is applied all across the board. On top of that, um, sales teams reach out to us um, the, the sheer number of people with accents, like there, there are way more accents than there are languages and, and as well as dialects. And uh, there will always be a lot of requests for uh, additional uh, data and uh, integration. And um, that's what makes this, this, this task fun. You know, there are always new applications. 
Yeah, I mean, it sounds like maybe a bit of a nightmare from the technical point of view because you you have so many pairs that you have to uh, translate between. Uh, how do you choose, or or do you have to choose? Uh, how, how many? Yeah, so we we choose different permutations. Um, uh, I mean, of course, you got to start off somewhere. Uh, we're starting off with um, with uh, three accents, really: um, standard American English, um, which is North American English. Uh, Indian and, and, and Philippines, uh, Philippine accents, uh, which we built these really cool clustering analyses to better figure out uh, the location of, of these uh, input accents and uh, what makes sense to build models around. Um, but, you know, really quickly, we're expanding into Africa, Southern African um, dialects, um, Eastern European dialects, European dialects. Mm. Uh, South American dialects, Central American dialects, and Caribbean dialects. Right, right. And obviously, there's a there's a business benefit to doing this, but there's also a, a, an impact on the people that that technology uh, touches and and, and influences. Um, have you seen? I don't know for, for any of the panelists. Have you seen any examples in the media or in in research of these technologies really uh, changing lives? Um, for example, you know, we see a number of number of articles about people who lose their voice and then they, they can have their voice recreated, you know, Val Kilmer and, and, and people like that. Um, but I'm sure there are, are many other examples of, of how these models that did support their accent or their, their dialect help them. Uh, and I suppose the, the, uh, the opposite is true, where these models lack the data um, or, uh, you know, the, the specific specificity, then it's, uh, it's letting a, a certain, you know, population down. If you come across any examples, or do you feel like that there are certain populations or groups that are currently underserved by speech, speech technologies today? So I think it's any any it's for all the reasons that we try and produce and make these technologies available that we are able to serve and help people, and um, so it's like really for the reason that we go into speech recognition so that it's easier for anyone to use their phone. And whether that be someone who's very young or someone who's older and has difficulty typing, that technology is there to make their lives easier and to benefit them. And it's almost to the extent that the it's 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 what um, what, we, what Maxim was just talking about. That anytime you're an edge case, there's a chance that this model is going to fail. And these models are prepared very well for the the for the distribution of people that has sat very central within uh, any kind of dialect or accent or what we define as being a language. And the further you then span away from that, the more extreme you get, the, the, quick, the more quickly these models deteriorate. And so then you start to take away these opportunities and these facilitators that these models provide. Um, so it really is a case that when, when you have the best success with these models, when the people that use them mo most closely match, uh, the people with whom they were intended for, but it's not always a case that everyone can use these models because sure. of that discrepancy. And as you move and you become an edge case, but then even if you are someone um, to whom this model is like directly trained for, having a model which is able to cope with a greater diversity of accents or dialects um, is then reassuring for you in the sense that we don't necessarily pronounce everything correctly every time. There, there's always going to be a chance that you're going to stutter, you're going to have a speech disfluency, mm. you might pronounce something differently one day than you did the day before, just True. based on the situation that you're in. Could be ill. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but um, having, having systems which are robust to uh, dialects, accents, then provides more robustness uh, to any individual who is using this, these technologies as it mitigates the chance of you falling into that edge case category. Very true. Yeah, you, if you build for the uh, the extreme cases, then you, you better support the people uh, in the middle as well. Um, do, do you think there's a, an argument to say that the the tools are built for people that more closely match the people building the tools? You know, like, you know, a lot of these tools come out of North America or China. You know, it's very big. They've got a lot of data, a lot of people working on the product, and therefore the tools really match <laughs> those groups of people and everyone else. Well, you know, maybe we'll build it for them. You know, when the time comes, but. You know, perhaps it, increasing the diversity of the workforce and the, and the tools would then have a knock-on effect. Yeah, I I, I completely agree with that. I, I think um, pulling in more folks from um, more diverse backgrounds into speech in general, speech is a very very difficult space. In my eyes, it's the most difficult space in machine learning. And um, 
the barrier to entry into this space is, is quite large. Um, I mean, there's a, I remember for some reason, uh, the first thing I remember is this cool demo from uh, Google. They, they had this uh, uh, research called Paratron uh, with uh, um, a, a researcher, uh, Dmitry Konevsky, I believe his name was, uh, who uh, has a, a certain uh, pattern of speaking. Uh, and on top of that, um, he has a, a I, I, I believe he was deaf. Um, and on top of that, he uh, came from uh, Eastern Europe. I believe it was Russia as well. And when he's speaking into a system, nothing can ever recognize his speech until he built a system specifically tailored to recognize his speech. <laughs> so that's a great example of you know someone coming from quite a diverse background, building a machine learning algorithm that um, allows for them to um, communicate better um, and uh, allows for accessibility based off of their mm. uh, method of communication. And, and do you have any ideas of how that can be possible? I mean, obviously that you've got you know extreme, you've got uh, special cases like you know researchers who take it upon themselves. But how can we make more people around the world be able to contribute? I mean, I think of Mozilla and their open voice experiments. You know, capturing as much data from people as possible. Um, are there are there other projects going on? Do you think there are other initiatives that that should be started in order to be able to increase the diversity there? I think it starts in academic institutions, you, you know, bringing in more and more diverse folks uh, with different opinions. Um, I think colleges and universities have already been doing an incredible job at that. It's just we put it, we started putting an emphasis on that only recently. Um, and this is something that, uh, you know, the fruits of which grow, um, mm -hmm. uh, it, they take time to grow. So um, I think it's just a matter of time until this, this improves. That's a good point. Absolutely. Yeah. I would say that it's it's on it's on the scope for research institutions. Currently, um, the way the way in which the field operates is almost as a sense that you have it work on a large amount of data. In, in the case of whether that be North America and uh, China, wherever wherever the focus is currently, and then again you show that hey look, this also works quite well on something that's very low resource. Mm. Like we can train on one hour of data and get very reasonable performance. So it's a case that like it's becoming more well known, but at the moment it's um, kind of something that's a bit more flashy in the sense. Yeah, it's a stretch uh, goal. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not really the benchmark yet. So I think there's going to have to be a change in mindset, and as systems get better, they'll be able to handle these more challenging dialects and accents and low resource settings. Mm. Because it's not necessarily well. I guess there are two ways that we can approach it. We can say that we need more data to train these systems. Or we can say that we we need systems that can be trained on less data, yeah. or we can get a junction of both. And at the moment, the field is kind of going down more the path of hey, look, we have a limited amount of data. Let's try and have models which perform really well on this low resource setting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's and, actually. Uh, sorry, I interrupted. <laughs> no, 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 exactly what Max like. There, there's going to exactly what Maxim said. There's going to have to be a shift in mindset towards in these institutions of okay, like the the goal. The goalposts have to shift. The, the currently the, the way that we're doing it is still they're kind of there's something a bit more flashy rather than the, the main goal. Yeah, yeah. And Sancho, this is something that's really important. Just the impact of zero shot or low shot learning um, in in speech, especially, is is very important in building um, commercially viable uh, products. Because the reality is, data, especially speech data, is notoriously expensive. Um, and uh, I'm sure Matteo knows this personally <laughs> from building uh, the application. It's 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 absurd. And um, personalization of these machine learning models can allow for extremely high performance um, based off of people's speech, um, and uh, also account for a lot of these edge cases in speech as well. But no one has 15 hours to record their speech, and no one also has a studio uh, to record their speech. Mm. So. Um, it's, um, it's, it's, it's an open, open problem, but I, I do think for commercial products, that's really important. And the reason why commercial products in general are important is the more money, the, the more money a certain area in machine learning has, uh, the more research fi financing happens and, and all that. I mean, just look at computer vision and what happened to that. So, um, I think speech is the next frontier and, uh, I'm really excited to see how many people are excited about it too.
It is very exciting. Um, I was very excited to see the, the demo or hear the demo of, of your product uh, maybe about a year ago, actually, it was why it was impressive then. I'm uh, even more excited to hear what it sounds like today. Uh, I don't know if it's possible we can do the demo uh, now, like if you have some slides or you've got some audio that we can listen to. Uh, no, I mean, I, I do have slides, but uh, the, so the demo is probably going to be, um, it's, it's probably best for, for it to be done live. Um, with me on, on the line, we have um, Vikram. Uh, I don't know how well you guys hear, hear him, but um, Vikram, do, do you hear us, hear us well? I can hear you well, Max. Excellent. Vikram, if you could, before moving into the demo and, and showing some of the sauna synthesis, could you please... Um, Tell us a little bit about yourself so that we could hear your voice and also get to know you a little bit better. Sure, Max, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Vikram, and I'm a voiceover artist currently based in Pune, Maharashtra, which is West India, but originally from North India, Delhi. So I've been doing voiceovers for the last six years now, and the languages I do voiceovers in, Hindi, which is my native language, and English, uh, in Indian accent. So awesome. before I became a voice actor, I have also worked in a call center. So I have worked in many uh, US-based processes like Verizon, uh, AOL, United Airlines, SanDisk. So I, I could relate to the agent's perspective and I'm really excited to perform a demo in front of you, in front of you all today with the latest version where I will be an agent and Max will be my customer. Amazing. Awesome, Vikram. If you could, could you please enable synthesis for the uh, Brian model and uh, we could go through the health IQ script. Great. Okay. Thank you for calling health IQ. I just want to let you know that this call will be recorded for quality assurance in 20 episodes. Hello, I'm calling in because I want to know more information about the Medicare Advantage plan. Can you please assist me with that? Sure. I would be Happy to help you with that. Are you looking to enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan today? Yes, I am. I'm very curious about the new plans, and I hope you could help me with that during this call. Sure. Uh, before we begin, I'm legally obliged to inform you that sir, you are not required to provide health-related information to me during this call, unless it is needed to determine enrollment eligibility. Uh, do you have any questions regarding this policy? Sure, I understand. No questions. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. So, may I have your complete first and last name and your phone number as well? No problem. My name is Max Hunt, M-A-X-H-U-N-T. My phone number is 601-235-8901. Thank you. Let me read it back to you. It's Max Hunt, and your number is 601-235-8901. Is it okay if I call you back in case you get disconnected? Yeah, that's right. And yeah, please call me back if the call gets disconnected. Thank you. Are you the Medicare beneficiary on the person who will be enrolling in the plan? Yeah, I am. May I please know the benefits and updates to the new plan? I'm really interested to know more about what's available to me. Absolutely. Please stay on the line while I connect you to one of our licensed agents. They will be able to explain all of the different plans we offer. Sounds good. Thank you very much for assisting me. You've been very helpful. I really appreciate it and have a great day. Thank you for calling Health IQ and have a great day. Vikram, if you could, could you now please uh, enable the uh, uh, Catherine model? Catherine? Yeah, and could you just read the first line so that they could also hear female synthesis, female voice synthesis? Thank you for calling Health IQ. I just want to let you know that this call will be recorded for quality assurance and training purposes. So, yeah, thank you, Vikram. You guys get the idea. Synthesize pretty well. Uh, this is unseen speech, unseen speaker, unseen utterances. So it's deployment setting. Um, uh, low latency. Nice yeah, our model performs with a 150 millisecond latency, uh, with around a sub 15 percent CPU utilization on even a brick of a computer. Wow. So <laughs> single core processor, you know, <laughs> like that level. So. Um, yeah, it sounded very, very faithful and easier to easier to listen to as well. I can imagine it's much more easily uh, or much more uh, well received by uh, the American audience, for example. That well, the important thing for us is our take is is people should never be forced to change the way they communicate to hold a job. You know, you go into these call center environments, 
People end up working day in and day out and uh, they get a lot of abuse. Like the reason why we started Saunas two years ago is because uh, it was started by uh, me and my uh, co-founders who are all Stanford engineers. Um, we had a close uh, friend who's a systems engineer, this guy named Raul. And uh, Raul's home country, Nicaragua, was going through a very tumultuous time period. There's a big revolution that was happening and he had to take a leave of absence from his education, go back home to support his family. Um, and that involved him basically working in a call center. And uh, a systems engineer was working in a call center answering customer queries associated with broken computers. Um, and now you would think someone with that profile would outperform everyone in a call center environment, but mm. the truth is actually quite distinct. He was underperforming. And the reason why he was underperforming wasn't because of a lack of knowledge. I mean, this guy's a systems engineer. He knows computers in and out. Um, it wasn't because of him not knowing what to say. It was because of how he communicated with customers. Uh, because he had a very thick uh, Central American accent. And uh, that led to him being mistreated uh, on a daily basis, people saying all sorts of horrifying, mean uh, racial slurs to him on a daily basis. And, you know, conventional, I don't know about France, but conventional service jobs in the United States are largely, you know, waiting tables, working as a cashier or something along those lines. But in India, a service job ends up being working in a call center. Uh, and most college students end up doing that um, instead of waiting tables in, as you know, as an equivalent to the United States. Um, now imagine you're waiting tables and every third interaction, someone says horrible things about where you're from and the way you communicate and, and your, your accent. You know, of course you're gonna hate this job. You're, you're mm -hmm. gonna wanna move out and you wanna, if you don't have any other choice, you're forced to change the way you sound to maintain the job. and. Um, that's why the central motto of Sonus is your voice, your choice. You know, we, we want to allow people to control the way they communicate. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. So you're saying that, you know, your technology helps to tackle other forms of bias against people, you know, with different accents and thereby improves opportunities for them in the, in the workplace. So it's, it's absolutely doing some good. And it's a great example of, uh, of how technology can uh, improve people's situation in that way. Um, Let's let's talk about the, the current situation then briefly. I just wanted to uh, get the lay of the land with regards to, you know, what technologies are most affected by uh, biases and lack of diversity before we then dive into uh, some of the, the solutions and the research that's going on uh, in the space. Um, what would you say? This is a question to, to all of you. Of where, where do these where do these problems uh, where are they most concentrated? Where where is uh, where does the work need to take place? Um, are there you know is it speech to text, text to speech? Voice transformation, you know, or other technologies, um, and uh, and which areas are, are really lagging behind? Maybe Sanchez, do you have a do you have a feel, uh, feeling on this? Yeah. So personally, from a speech recognition background, it's very much the case that within within academia, there's a, a real focus on honing in on 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 these typical data sets. So. Mm. We see time and time again, state-of-the-art models on a single data set, Libri Speech, which is 1,000 hours of read audiobooks from mm. Box Project. Um, so in that regard, we're almost oblivious to it. We, the, the objective is always to attain state-of-the-art on, on this data set. And um, performance is always defined by the word error rate that you get on Libri Speech, which has so many shortcomings when it comes to diversity, not just in pronunciation, accent, dialects, but in, in any any domain that we've spoken about as well. Um, so just from a speech recognition perspective, there's uh, there's very much a discrepancy with uh, between what we see in academia and what we see in the industry as well. Hmm. That's kind of known and there's kind of there's competition within re research that we want to hone in and get this data set solved and we see separately within the community and within industry that we want something that's very different and that's okay like they, the two can exist harmoniously in, in different ways it's just being able to understand what the needs and the demands are of each and so we are starting to see that that shift in 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 industry as well of needing to tackle these issues for ourselves and it's being able to fine-tune these models and like take these models and tune them on a small amount of data that is relevant to your use case there's really opening the door uh, for these models to be used by anyone. Um, so it's really democratized machine learning or speech recognition in that regard. Uh, so we're, we're, we're seeing models that can be used now 
on a, on a, on a, on a wider mm -hmm. number of use cases because of that ability to be trained on, on a very small amount of data. Right, right. But would you say that the industry has the edge because of the, the funding that they have? They're just able to produce larger, better quality data sets? Uh, so it's, it's, it's not always necessarily the case that like the industry is then better than research in, in terms of like the, the, the models that are being produced. It's different, different goals. And so in the sense that research uh, often has a different goal to what industry wants. And so there is there is then the the argument of funding like one has more funding than the other but then also the uh the goal the end goal is very different in both mm. so both then target their energy into different into two different paths and uh what is what is quite cool in in industry as well is that um we do see the emergence of these technologies that work very well in areas that we deem to be very difficult um and so it's then making sure that we then share what it is that means this technology works so well, or we share the data sets that we create, curate, and mm -mm. we make sure that we can progress the field forward together in a very like, open source or open science <laughs> manner, which is something that we're very passionate about at Hugging Face. Well, uh, exactly. I mean, you're, you're, the, you're synonymous with that, really. Like you're, you're the leaders in that field. Um, is that the mission that Hugging Face was was built upon? Yes. Yeah, so it's it's currently our goal to democratize good machine learning. So the idea being that we, we're working with the community, we are the community, we're, we're at one with the community in order to progress and further machine learning, whether that be NLP speech vision. In my case, it's working on speech recognition. Um, so trying to make everything as transparent as possible, trying to work with one another. Uh, we very much believe that when you have a community working together with one end goal, mm -hmm. you can progress at a rate which is a, a thousand times faster than if you were doing it as an individual, you have all that intellect, you have all that resource, you have all that time, energy that you can combine and work towards an end goal. So in terms of being able to solve these big issues, that is the fastest way that we deem to being able to solve machine learning. And that's why we're so passionate about open source. Of course. And that holds true with speech recognition as well. Like many of the problems that we've discussed and we've been talking about, they, they can also it's not very it's a case that they can very much be helped with a collaborative open source approach so when it comes to data sets we we know that you can curate data sets based on communities which are um which are very much not served currently and then you can model and deploy it and then that's great so like maybe we can take that data set and combine it with other data sets where we have other people who are right. facing more issues and hopefully try and solve the field as a whole for everyone mm -hmm. Very nice. Is it the wrong question to, to ask which technologies are more affected by diversity and, and bias? Or is it you know more upstream? It's the case of the, like I was saying, the data sets and the, the people working on them that really affects all of the technologies equally? Or, or do you see certain technologies being affected more by these problems than others? No, we definitely do see within, within speech recognition as a whole. I think it, 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 it affects everyone uh who's who's subject to who interacts with these technologies so from the practitioner's point of view it's that model is a reflection of your work so if that mm. model is biased it's a reflection that you've you've created a model which is innately biased that comes down to a certain degree into the work that you put in the data set then as well um and, and the model itself so i think it affects every part of the pipeline um it's somewhat subjective to what extent it affects and to, to what degree. I think that comes down to what your priorities are and mm -hmm. you deem to be important. Um, but for us at Hanging Face, it's making sure that these technologies are accessible for everyone. And so it does, it's a very big and important issue. Wonderful. Well, um, my next question really was what can be done to increase diversity and reduce biases in uh, data sets and models? You've already proposed some great solutions like getting the community involved. Are there any other? Uh, projects that you you think uh, the that are needed in academia or in, in industry, um, and are there any examples of things that are going on right now that you can you can point to to say this is this is really helping? Uh, a question can for I raise a question? Uh, yeah. 
sometimes we have some issues to gather some data. I don't know about you, but when we talk about the south, the south in probable in the in the world, for example, we can't get data from Africa for all the speaking parts of Africa because people don't participate or maybe they don't have the tools and the and the skills. So I don't know how it is for you. How do you do when you don't have data? It's just sometimes you want the data, you propose the tools, but no one is using them. Mm. Go ahead, Maxine. My take is, is like, it's really important. I mentioned earlier the significance of commercialization of, of, of products and as, as a method for making research more popular and, and, and larger. In my eyes, um, especially in Africa, uh, um, I, I think that's a really good point. It's, it's really important, though, uh, to incentivize corporations to provide such data or even government entities. Um, I, I think that's probably the best methodology for uh, receiving this. Um, if there's some sort of material benefit that is yielded uh, from a certain company, which on a daily produces large amounts of speech data, um, to provide you with the speech data, then at the end of the day, they, they will. I mean, so far in Sonos, like we've used our customers to gather huge, huge amounts of data. Um, we've also gathered our own data. I mean, we had uh, 50 studios spread. I mean, when we were doing India data gathering some time ago, we had 50 studios uh, spread across 50 different areas in India, recording data 24 seven for months on end. Um, and uh, uh, of that we had customers giving us uh, deployment setting real-time production level data mm. um, that's actually another good point you, you know just the sheer difference between even like red speech versus unread speech you, you know for building speech to text engines like the differences in word error rates are simply um un unparalleled you, you, you know and um the closer you get to industry the better because that's more closer to deployment setting and um we noticed that in studio recordings versus actual um, enterprise deployments that we've had. Um, but yeah, they're all learnings um, that have come with uh, blood, sweat, and tears for us. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> Not blood, and, but sweat. And, and, and outside of the <laughs> industrial setting, uh, like, are you aware of projects, or or do you have ideas on how we can reach out to to these dialect communities and uh, and capture more of that data and yeah. I mean, you mentioned incentives. Like, are there other projects that you've seen that that do that well? I, I think, like, I think governments are already doing that. I remember seeing eight months ago, nine months ago, um, the Singapore government released, um, you know, like two thousand, three thousand hour data set with um, different dialects that come from Singapore and different accents and voices. I, I've seen the Russian government release a lot of data sets. I heard, I've I've seen some cool things in the UAE. Uh, United Arab Emirates too. Oh, yeah. I think at its core, it's not a problem of data. I, I think it's like a problem of uh, finding this data <laughs> because oftentimes all this is released uh, um, uh, uh, in, in, in their local languages. And that's why communities that Hugging Face has built and other really cool speech-based companies and NLP-based companies have built are, are, are so important because it, it simplifies finding these data sets uh, and building right. these models. But even when you build these models, you don't know what bias is in the, these data sets. You know, there's Libre speech, but uh, God knows what sort of bias or um, um, issues pop up from that specifically. So. For sure. Mathieu, uh, do, do you have any other thoughts on this uh, around the solutions to, to capturing yes. more of this data? It's quite complicated because when we released the app, we really wanted the entire French speaking world to take part in it. And uh, we were very disappointed by seeing that no one from Africa or some very little islands were participating. And we still don't know how to, to, to catch them. Maybe it's a problem issues with the technology or maybe they are not interested in. So it's I'm, I'm still looking for some answers as well when we use social media, you know, to try to involve and to to have the people taking part in it. They don't always see the, the interest. So maybe they are not, I don't know, not affected the same way as us. So it's very, very curious. Mm. And I think this also goes back to like the whole point about uh, that Sanchez mentioned earlier about zero shot or low shot learning and building these personalized models because gathering this data is very difficult. And there are just so many different regional accents within Africa in general and South Africa uh, alone. So 
It's very complicated. Thank and you. also it has to make financial sense too. You know, like if there are only a hundred people that speak a specific dialect, does it make financial sense for a large corporation to, I mean, it's very controversial, but right. you know, does it make sense for it to gather this data? For startups, mm -hmm. it's hard because, you know, every single tiny little impact on your margin you really care about. But for these big, big tech players, um, that's where I think they should really step up because sheer amount of money they have, it, it's, it's absurd. Yeah, and the same arguments applied to dialects. Like we, we often see in the news, you know, there's some tribal language that's about to die out and there's some GoFundMe campaign or something for it. But then there's the argument, you know, like, is it worth preserving? Like this, you know, you've got 300 people or something and they're not going to last beyond a generation. Um, and yeah, is it really, uh, is it really worth spending the, the, the effort? Um, Sanchez, you, you had a, a thought? Yeah, so just I, I think one of the biggest motivators for anyone to go and help and curate and try and help solve this problem is experiencing this technology for themselves, seeing what the shortcomings are and understanding what it is that they can do to possibly help contribute. So in the sense that um, someone who is completely uh, detached from the ML sphere is probably going to be very reluctant to donate their voice. Like, mm. what's my data, what's it going to be used for? Is someone going to be able to track me down? Uh, but if it's a case that they've tried using these technologies, they understand that they have a part to play. They can help. They can be part of that community that helps solve this problem. They're going to be so much more motivated to go and donate their voice, to go and transcribe some data. And we had a question in the chat about what our thoughts were on Common Voice. And from my point of view, I think it's a great data set that uh, has really facilitated a lot of research from a huge variety of speakers, styles, accents. Um, it's, it's hard to know what the, the, who donates their voice to Common Voice. Like, who is it that goes and really decides with the with the latest releases that they're going to go and donate their voice their voices? Are we still within the machine learning sphere, or have we do, do can we can we pull in external influence and and really make it something that is truly diverse? And even with Common Voice, it's just like even quality assurance. Um, there, there are no specific quality assurance for common voice, I believe, is crowdsourced as well, um, where you have a certain number of folks confirming a certain utterance versus not confirming an utterance. And that's a problem in of itself because you don't know what bias these people have when analyzing these utterances. You don't, they don't have a solid, fixed um, methodology of, um, of assessing this. And what common voice is playing along is just the law of large numbers. You, you know, it's like, the more samples you have, the more accurate it is to reality. But um, I think that's another problem. So then I think it's understanding with Common Voice that you then directly have influence as to how the final data set looks. If you think that there's a bias, then you can get involved and you can upvote utterances which you think are transcribed correctly. You can downvote the ones that you aren't. And so in, in the sense that it is very democratized, in the sense that it's people going and feeding into that data set, but then who is it? Who, who, who are these people? And I think we just need to really make clear that the power that is held within within that system, because it is crowdsourced, it's wonderful in that regard. But I think that's a very good point in terms of there's the biases in terms of who's donated their voice, who's transcribed, and then who's verified. We just need to have, to, for the law of large numbers to work, we need the data is a reflection of the people that have donated their voices, the people who have mm -hmm. trans So, yeah. Indeed. Uh, my last question then was really just about your, your, your companies and your efforts to increase diversity, reduce bias in your models, in your data sets, in your staff. Um, what efforts have you taken? What lessons have you learned? And what advice would you give to other companies and researchers uh, looking to do this? I mean, at least for us, um, we're a 40 person company. Um, we have, um, I think, 80 or 90 percent of the folks that join Sonus are, are immigrants. And the reason why they're joining Sonus is because everyone has a certain story, an accent story. You know, um, the core vision and the core impact of Sonus is very closely associated with diversity and, and uh, the impact and, and, uh, that that diversity has. So um, I think on that front, we've been doing great. Um, on the front of uh, doing uh, of, of gathering data, um, it, it's um, really important for us to gather a lot of like the low resource dialects as well. But um, it's um, 
it's very complicated and very difficult because just the sheer number of dialectical changes that happen. Mm. Uh, but it's just really investing in, in these resources for us. And um, that's what being, we've been actively doing. From, from a hugging face point, point of view, it's always been the case that we have been a company that's wanted to engage with the community. And it's always been a case that the problems that the community are facing are the ones that we want to be working on as well. Um, so in that regard, we're very intertwined with what problems people are facing and what changes they want to see happen. And we're very driven by that in terms of if the community find that there's a problem, that's something that we're going to want to try and fix with them. Uh, so it's always been our goal and our passion to really work uh, in that paradigm. And so from that regard, it's I don't think diversity and biases, that, that notion is never really going to be solved. I don't think there's ever going to be a time where we get to a point and we say that we've we've done this we're always going to have to iteratively improve in the same way that we always iteratively improve with our model performance and no point have we sat back on any machine learning task and gone yes that's solved because we know that in one year's time we're going to see new technology and we're going to hope beat that benchmark and we should try to do the same when it comes to biases as well uh, and so i don't think it's ever necessarily going to be a case that we're going to be finished, but always something that we should be continually working on and have it at the forefront of our minds when it comes to defining a task. Absolutely. Great. Go ahead. <laughs> One other small thing. Uh, mm. This goes back to sort of something we discussed earlier on during the call um, with regards to starting at the academic institutions when it comes to pulling in more diverse perspectives, more diverse worldviews. Um, I think diversity is largely like the people that you pull into your company is largely a function of the sample size that's available within the general market, right? Mm. And if there's a lack of a certain type of engineer um, with a certain diverse background uh, present within the general um, you know ecosystem of speech, it's it's hard to hire um, a, a proper number of these. And this includes you know people from minority backgrounds, uh, people from uh, you know, with certain gender identities and, um, and uh, uh, people even with certain worldviews, you know, and um, that's why I say, you know, it all starts off with academic institutions and it's so important to um, imbue that diversity um, really at the source. So. Mm -hmm. Great point. Uh, I realize we're running out of time. We've got three minutes left. Um, I wanted to ask very briefly, um, where can people find out more about uh, you and your companies uh, online? websites, Twitter, uh, newsletters, or any research that you're currently producing in order to, to help people uh, follow you uh, after the after the webinar. Maxim, go ahead. Sure, yeah. So, um, uh, so Sanus, we're going to, we, we recently raised a big round, so we'll be uh, doing a whole uh, large uh, uh, marketing change up. So I'm sure you guys will hopefully nice. hear about us in the news and <laughs> we're actively hiring a lot of researchers. So uh, mm. feel free to reach out to me personally if you're interested in joining. And uh, uh, yeah, we'll be updating our, our website um, uh, uh, quite soon with, with more JDs and um, various profiles, so. Good stuff. What's the URL for people who don't know? Oh, pardon? Sorry. No, the, the URL, what's the address? Oh, uh, sanus.ai. Sanus.ai, okay, go check it out. Uh, Mathieu, where can people find out about um, Les Français de nos régions? Yeah, well, on the on the website, the blog, which is francaisdenoregion.com, but the most interesting is the app that you can find Francais de Norégion on both um, uh, stores, app stores and Google stores. And don't hesitate to try and to give feedback. And if you're interested in uh, uh, analyzing the data, take contact with me or Nicola. And uh, for the next project, I would be happy to collaborate with uh, speech technology people. Excellent. Sanchez, go for it. <laughs> So the Hugging Face Hub is extremely self-contained. And so whether you just want to find out more about state-of-the-art machine learning models or data sets, there's plenty of information there. If you're a practitioner and you want to be able to use state-of-the-art machine learning models in two lines of code, we have a whole zoo of models that you can you can take and uh, you can use in, in, in just two lines of code. We have full modeling code if you want to go and dive in for yourself. And then also data sets as well. So we have thousands of data sets on the Hugging Face website. We can take a look. There's a data sets viewer. So in, for us in the audio domain, 
uh, you can load up a data set, you can listen to actual audio samples, you can see the transcriptions. So really get a feel for what it is, what the, what the kind of data set is that you're going to be training your model on, which we just discussed as being super important <laughs> for your eventual model outcome. Excellent. Checking out and the website for Hugging Face? Huggingface.co. .co. Got it. Thank you very much to all the panelists, uh, Maxime, Sanchez, Mathieu. It's been a pleasure. Thanks to you. Merci à tout le monde. Au revoir. <laughs> bon weekend. Thanks, guys. Okay, <laughs> I, I want to thank again maybe the, all of the speakers uh, from this session, starting from uh, Carl Robinson uh, from Rumble Studio. Thank you very much for this uh, brilliant uh, organization and orchestration uh, of this session. Uh, thank you, Sanchit Gandhi from uh, Hugging Face. Thank you, uh, Maxim uh, from Sanas, and uh, quite a uh, nice and impressive demo. Thank you very much. And thank you, Mathieu Avanzi uh, from, uh, from uh, the University of Neuchâtel and creator of the Français de nos régions uh, application and uh, project. And uh, it looks like uh, your cat wanted really hard to uh, <laughs> zoom bomb you today. So <laughs> say hello to your cat. And uh, maybe so this session and uh, the second edition of the Deep Voice uh, Paris. Um, so I want to thank all of the people who uh, make it possible to organize this session, starting from the uh, participants uh, from the, uh, for the audience, uh, either present physically uh, at IRCAM or uh, online on, uh, on Zoom. Uh, also, all the people who helped organizing uh, this uh, three days of uh, passionating uh, sessions, discussion, and a workshop at the sky. So I want also to thank the Sorbonne University and the Sorbonne Center for Artificial Intelligence for hosting us uh, for this uh, Neural Networks workshop. And uh, then I see you uh, next year for uh, new surprises uh, for the third edition of the Deep Voice Paris, so in 2023, uh, with a lot of uh, new things uh, to show up. And the thematic will be on singing voice. So uh, keep in touch with us, go to the website uh, of Deep Voice, and uh, yeah, do not hesitate to contact us. Thank you very much, everyone, and thank you again for the panelists for the last session. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, thanks. Thank you.